I've changed my theology from where it was, and I want to explain to you why I've changed my theology and see whether you want to change yours too. So the topic today is highly controversial, and it is why you should argue with God. Doesn't that sound controversial? Wouldn't the preacher normally tell you, don't argue with God, just do what he says. But today, I want to explain to you why I believe you should argue with God. Not without advice, not without argument, but if you have a good argument, I believe God wants to hear it. And I'm going to try and prove it to you from the scripture so that you can revise your theology and have a more... uh, powerful encounter with God. Hallelujah. Now, I've been very helped in my thinking by a book that I ordered, that I purchased, that cost me for a paperback, something like £27.50, where it cost the church. Um, And it's called God According to God. And the reason I wanted this paperback was because I knew it was a very challenging piece of work and I wanted to read it. And I had to search to find a copy. And when I found it, I was very happy um, to pay up. So this book called God According to God was uh, a large piece of what I was uh, inspired by when I preached last week on God and science and creation. And he carries on in his arguments. And he talks about why we should argue with God. That's how I would summarize it. He doesn't call the chapter that. But as I read between the lines, I saw where he was going. Amen? Amen. And I want us to look at our great patriarch of all the major three faiths, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This old man called Abram, or Avram, who became Avraham, who we call Abraham. And he was there with God in an encounter in Genesis 15, and, and he was underneath the gaze of the stars. Do you remember that? And there he was underneath the gaze of the stars and the Lord said to him, look up in the sky. Or actually, what some rabbis believe, God picked him up and took him up where he was in the sky. I like that one better. Because he doesn't actually say look. He look up. He says look. And so there he is and he's seeing all the stars of heaven. And as he sees all the stars of heaven, God gives him a challenge. And God says, can you count those stars, Avraham? I'm giving you a good Jewish pronunciation. Yeah? <laughs> and, and Avraham says, no God, I, I can't count them. Come on, you must be joking. Because remember, if you tried here to look at the stars and count them, you could count them, couldn't you? Because you the sky is so bad. We go like one, two, three, four, five, maybe six. <laughs> but out there in that clear sky where I believe he was lifted. Then he saw a multitude beyond possibility. And in fact, if you visited the Middle East, you would know what I'm talking about. You can see the stars like never before. It's amazing. And so Abraham is looking at these stars and saying, God, no, I can't count them. And God says, well, just as the number of the stars so shall your descendants be. Now that is a crazy kind of promise. Amen? And it says in the scripture, I think it's verse 6 of Genesis 15, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or accounted to him for righteousness. And we take that scripture, and the apostle Paul takes it and says, look, Abraham was accounted righteous before he even entered into the covenant of circumcision. And therefore, the promise precedes the law. Amen? And so, we see that this is a powerful scripture. He believed God. And because he believed God, God, as it were, gave him a ding, beautiful green tick, and a credit, and said, this is my man. Hallelujah. He didn't argue with God. He believed God. He accepted what God says. And there is our standard theology that whatever God says, so shall it be. Amen. No argument. (laughs) Hallelujah. Didn't somebody say, 
You are God from the beginning to the end. There's no need for argument. And then he says, you've got times and seasons in your hand. And he goes on to say, you don't need a man to be the God you are. It's like, whether you agree or you don't agree, no problem. But I want us to move on in the scripture to Genesis chapter 18. And uh, there's Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre, where he's living. And he sees three men approaching him. And he thinks... Let me entertain these strangers. We don't get many strangers around here. And these look like good-looking men. Men that I would like to sit and talk with. So he said, hey, man, come over here, please. And, and let me entertain you. And the three men came over. And after they talked, Abraham asked if he could prepare them some food. And he rushed and prepared food for them. And they sat and they ate. And then in the course of time, they were walking. And it says, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And God said, no, no, I really can't hide it from Abraham. And I want us to understand that in Scripture, the Bible says that there's a principle. God cannot do anything unless he first shows it to his prophet. Is that not a Scripture? Is it not in the Bible? And therefore, why does God have to show it to his prophet first if he's God? Because he gave man jurisdiction over the earth. So he has to get man to agree to his action. Wow. I'm telling you this is some things that are not in the book. But they're coming as I preach. Hallelujah. He gets that jurisdiction over the earth. So he has to ask the man, here's what I propose to do, even though I'm God. Would it be okay with you? You see, he said, I'm going to go and wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah because they're exceedingly wicked. And if they're as bad as what I've heard, this is it. It's all over for them. And Abraham says, uh, excuse me, God. Um, you know, you, I thought you were a better God than that. I thought, you know, you, you didn't treat the righteous and the wicked the same. What if there's some righteous people over there, like maybe 50? Would you... Just wipe them out with all the good, all the evil lot at the same time. Amen? And God says, mm, no, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't do that. If, if I found 50 there, I wouldn't do it. Abraham gets a little bit more courage. He says, well, God, you know, I'm just, you know, a little dust. But would you do that if there were five missing from the 50? You can do the math, God. God goes, no, I wouldn't do it if there were 45 righteous people there. And then the conversation continues, and he says, look, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you, God, but what about if there's only 40? And God says, no, for 40, I wouldn't do it. And Abraham says, well, since I've started talking now, let me talk some more. What about if there's only 30? And God said, no, for 30, I'd save it. And now he's getting really, you know, like, I'm, I know I'm pushing it, God, but what about if there's only 20? God says, no, for the sake of 20, I'll save the city. And then Abraham says, look, just one last time, I want to ask you a question. What if there's only 10 good people in the whole of Sodom and Gomorrah? Would you wipe it off the map? And God says, no, not even for 10. Now, God went beyond what Abraham even asked. Because if you look at who came out of Sodom and Gomorrah, we know it was Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, and one of them never even made the whole journey because she looked back. So she was found to not be righteous. And out of those two cities, God only found three righteous people. Well, he didn't spare the city for them, as he said. He'd only spare it for 20. But he pulled out the righteous because, I believe, Abraham had had this conversation with him. So when I ask you the question, should you argue with God, does that not make you think that it's a good idea sometimes, if you have a good argument, to argue with God? Because you can change God's mind. And in fact, I believe God wanted Abraham to help him to make the right decision. Why? Because it's not really so much a master-servant relationship that our Lord is looking for. 
it is a partnership. When Jesus came, did he say to the 12 disciples, I'm looking for 12 slaves. I'm looking for 12 people who are going to sell out all they've got, follow me, and when I click my fingers, the only question would be, how high should I jump? Is that what Jesus told them? No. He took a lot of nonsense from them. He took a lot of discussion. He took a lot of dissent because he didn't want them to be robotic followers. Hallelujah. And yet in church today, sometimes we are teaching and preaching as if all God wants is for us to rip up all our rights and just whatever he says goes, no questions asked, that's the perfect Christian. I say it's not. Amen? That is the Christian that God is not looking for. God is looking for a Christian who will reason with him as a partner, not as an equal partner, maybe as a junior partner, but nonetheless a partner. Hallelujah. You know, in a marriage, it could be, and it often is, you don't really have two equal partners. Amen? In a marriage, partners are not equal in every area, are they? You know, one might be very good financially and mathematically. Another one might be very good artistically, creatively. One might be good in relationships. The other might be a disaster. And so on. But the partnership allows the two parties to make their contribution. They've agreed to work together. Hallelujah. I want to tell you this. In a marriage, any time the arguments stop, in my opinion, the marriage is in trouble. Hallelujah. You know, we always try and tell people when we're preaching at marriage service, you know, how marriage should be sweet and lovely and make sure there's no arguments in your house. Nonsense. Nonsense, I say. Anytime your partner is not worth an argument, that relationship is in trouble. Anytime your partner says to you, that's the last argument we're ever going to have, that means the intention of that partner is that this relationship is finished. I haven't got time for this anymore. That's an exit signal. Amen? Don't worry too much about arguments. Praise God. You might not like them, but they are necessary to bring the best out of a partnership. There's been research done that shows that when you have these kinds of rebalancing acts, you come out with better solutions than if one person just made up their mind and went ahead. Amen. My wife's looking very worried at me now. What are you telling them? (laughs) Hallelujah. Now, I want us to think about somebody who wasn't even a believer, Abimelech. You know Abimelech? Abimelech was the king in the the Philistine area. And one night, it says in Genesis 21 to 7, God came to Abimelech in a dream and said to him, you are as good as dead. (laughs) God said you're as good as dead. And you're a Philistine king. You should expect to be good and dead. Amen? Because the woman that is in your house is not your wife. She belongs to another man. Abimelech didn't take it lying down. He knew that this was a a divine being speaking to him. But he he said, look, Lord, you, you can't hold this against me. You can't destroy me. I'm a righteous man. I have not touched this woman yet. So you can't call me guilty when I'm innocent. Imagine if he didn't put up a defense argument, what might have happened to him. (laughs) But he started to argue, and God had to listen to the argument, even of the unsaved heathen Philistine, the enemy of Israel, because he acted with good conscience. Amen? And so God said to him, not in a, a physical appearance, but in a dream, I know you, you've been a good boy. And you haven't done anything wrong. That's why I kept you from making a mistake. I've been looking out for you. You see, God is not a prejudiced God. God wants all men everywhere to repent and come to a knowledge of the truth. Amen? And so this God was being reasonable with this man. Because the man was being reasonable with God. And God said, look, go and get hold of this prophet. 
Abraham, let him pray for you. When he does, then you're going to be all right. But make sure you send him away with a good blessing. Wow. It kind of seems like a setup, doesn't it? But it was a setup. Amen. God very often gets people into a position where he can almost have a confrontation with them in order to bring a better result. God knows the value of a good confrontation. Amen. Didn't Jesus have many confrontations in the scripture? He wasn't a peace-loving man like, hey, you Pharisees, let, let's not argue. Let's just be friends. No, you whitewashed wolves, you hypocrites. You're full of dead man's bones. Your righteousness stinks. Why? It's horrible. Makes me want to vomit. Amen. That's basically what he was saying. Amen. The apostle Paul, before he became the apostle, was on his way to kill some Christians, basically. Take them by prisoner. Bring them to Jerusalem and let whatever happened to them happen. Pull them out of another country. That was extradition he was doing. Illegal extradition. The Americans weren't the first. Amen. He goes there. He pulls. He's going to, intending to pull them out. On the way, he meets this great light and hears this voice. God is having a confrontation. Paul, thank God, didn't go, oh, I'm sorry, it's over. I've been caught red-handed. He said, who are you? What are you doing? I don't get this. What's going on? And that is a man that God can use. Somebody who answers back. Amen. Look at Moses at the, at the, the burning bush. He's told, go back to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Hey, hang on, God, are you talking to me? I can't even put my words together right right. <laughs> and he starts to talk, to, to talk back to God. Amen? And God says, that's a man I can use. Do you know this? Let's go on with Abraham for a minute. Genesis 22, it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Yes, sir. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning. It's like he couldn't wait to get rid of his son. Amen? <laughs> I don't want to say anything there. Now, Abraham got up. I'll be in trouble. Loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, which was probably Isaac, yeah? Cutting wood for his own sacrifice. He set out for the place God had told him about. This was the man that could argue for his unrighteous relative Lot, who wasn't really, maybe he was a good guy, but he could argue for his, his nephew. But he couldn't argue for his own son. What kind of guy is this? Yes, in the end, he, he was willing to sacrifice him. And God said, because you've not withheld your son, your only son, I, I'm going to really bless your descendants. But do you recognize this? That that was the end of his active relationship with God. His obedient compliance, even though it brought a blessing. We never again see God talking to Abraham again in the scripture after this. Why? He should have argued back. Amen? Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, Hey, hang on God. Isn't there some other way out of this? He didn't go, yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. No. He said, hang on, this is, this, is, this is a lot. This is too much almost. Isn't there some other way you got that? Don't you have a plan B? God didn't even answer him. Amen? Because that one had to be. But at least he had a, a dialogue. Amen? At least he tried. Praise God. Now, I want us to see what happens after Abraham does this sacrifice, just so you can see it. Then Abraham returned to his servants. Uh, hang on, didn't he say, uh, me and the boy will go up there and sacrifice? Didn't he say that? And then we'll come back? Abraham. Do you see that? 
return to his servants. Just Abraham. The Bible is very clear. It's giving you a clue. And Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Now, the next thing we know, the next verse, Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She died at Kiriath Abba. <laughs> that is Hebron in the land of Canaan. That's where the Hittites were. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah, who was 30 miles away. Why? Because imagine if I took my son Peter up some mountain somewhere and said, son, lie down here while I tie you up. And then I got a knife out and was about to plunge it in his heart. Don't you think that relations might be a little bit tetchy after that? Yeah? Especially as I hadn't said anything to God about it. I was just like, yeah, let's get on with this. And then, uh, you know, when he goes back and tells mom, don't you think relations might be a little bit a little bit icy. My only son, you, you, you decided to do this. You didn't say anything to me. You just decided you're going to listen to God and kill our only son, Isaac. The, I know we got Ishmael, but he's not even at home anymore and he's not mine. Oh, my. So Abraham went from where he was living to mourn for his estranged wife and weep over her. But you never saw that before. Amen? It gets worse. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites, I'm a foreigner and stranger among you. That's how he came to buy this land. Because his wife happened to die there. He didn't live there. He didn't know them. Then we come to uh, the next thing that happens is his son. Amen? What we see is this. After the binding, Abraham was in Beersheba. His wife was in Hebron. The binding is what the, the Jewish people call when he was held on the altar. Then after her death, Abraham moves up to roughly where Jesus was growing up in Galilee. 130 miles north, slightly east. And he settles there. Then in Genesis 24, we see this. Abraham's there. He's now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the God of heaven and earth that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I'm living, but you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. Now, before we go on with this slide, let me ask you, why do you think I've got a mouse sitting on an elephant's trunk? <laughs> it's not a dying elephant. The elephant in this thing is a little bit, a bit rude almost, is representing God. And the mouse is representing you and I. Amen? And... For a mouse to tell an elephant what to do or to be in partnership with an elephant is a kind of strange concept, isn't it? But God is so big. I mean, we really be like the, the baby of an ant <laughs> on the elephant, but it wouldn't show up very well on the slide. And even then, we'd be too big. But the fact is, we are the very junior partner of God, and God could at any time flick us off and say, I don't need you. But God chooses to entertain a fellowship with us. Isn't that amazing? What a God we serve. And so here is Abraham looking for a son, uh, sorry, a wife for his son Isaac. Now you always assume that Isaac was at home with his dad. Let's read on. Verse 12, let's jump. Then he prayed, this is the servant, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring and daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water for your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Why am I showing you these verses? Because here is a man 
who is the servant of Abraham, he's learned how to reason with God. He's in a dialogue with God. And by being in a dialogue with God, he gets blessed. Amen. He doesn't say, oh God, my master Abraham sent me and I'm sure everything's done. Thank you, Lord. Finished. No. He says, God, make it happen. Make it happen, please. Amen. He gets his own discussion with God going. Praise the Lord. That's what you need to do if you want something to happen. Have your own direct dialogue. Don't come to your pastor saying, Pastor, please pray for me. I need the exam success. Why can't you pray for yourself? For your own exam success. Amen? There are many things that you could have done for yourself, but you're having to wait because you don't think that you can relate. But God will relate with Abimelech, who's not even a believer. How much more with you? Amen? In Genesis 24, 62, 66, now Isaac had come from Beer Lahoi Roy, which is the place, the well where God sees. Remember when Hagar was kicked out and, and there was that well that she suddenly saw in the middle of the Negev Desert in the south? She said, this is the well where God sees. Amen? And he went there. Why did he go there? Because he went to find, I believe, his relative. Amen? Who was his relative? Ishmael, his half-brother. Because he didn't feel safe around his father anymore who tried to kill him. Isn't that shocking? But he was there. Why wasn't he with dad up in Galilee area? There's only one logical explanation. The two of them had fallen out. Because at the burial of the father Abraham, who was there? Ishmael and the son. Amen? Now, he's out there. He's in the field. He's meditating. Thank God he's kept up the family faith, we believe. As he looks up, he sees camels approaching. You know, while you are yet praying, I will answer you. That's what the Lord says. And Rebecca looks up. And she sees Isaac. Maybe he's on a hill somewhere because she's on a camel. So if she's looking up, he must be up there somewhere. Amen. Maybe he found a little hill where he's meditating. And she got down from her camel and she asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. That was prophetic. Who had sent him on this mission? Abraham. Who is his master now? He's saying, this is the guy that's inheriting everything. He's my master. Amen? And so she took a veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he'd done. Why? Because Isaac didn't have a clue. And dad wasn't there to explain. He was 130 miles away. Are you getting it? Praise God. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah. It wasn't the one that Abraham kept. It's the one that Isaac took when he left his mother. or stayed, They both left together. And they went away from their crazy father with the knife. Amen. He got the blessing from God for obeying. But because he didn't argue with God, he lost his family. Amen. I don't want to miss the blessing. But I don't want to lose my family. right where it says Israel map of Israel okay is it there yeah okay where it says map of Israel in the New Testament Israel is right over the Dead Sea to the left of that you can see a big star with a compass on it you see that on the right-hand side of the compass is Hebron, right in that red triangle. Oh, sorry, the red circle. The red circle is the Negev. Negev simply means south, the southern part of Palestine or Israel in those days. And then to the immediate south 
just above where it says Idumea, it says Beersheba. So these are some of the spots where this action was happening. And right up at the top where that uh, pink arc is, in the top left corner of the map, roughly is where Abraham was living until his death. So we, we pop to the, the death of Abraham. I'm coming towards the close of this message. I hope you're getting something from it. If you are, just make a big amen. Put it in the chat. Say, I'm getting revelation. I'm seeing something new. Abraham lived 175 years. That's not bad, is it? Good innings. Then, so Sister Junie, 105 more years, yeah? Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age. Oh! An old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people. Thank God that means he made it by faith. Whenever the Bible says he was gathered to his people, it means he made it to the proper ancestors of faith. So somehow, even though Abraham was alive and he was the father of faith, there were other people of faith, people like Enoch, amen? Others who had believed God, people like Seth, people who had believed in God, they were there before him. And then it says, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Mal. Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephraim, son of Zohar the Hittite. So we assume that somehow Ishmael found out and got there. No, Ishmael was already there when the news came to the son and the two of them were in contact. And then Abraham's body had to be brought all the way back down south in order for him to be buried in the cave that he had purchased. Amen? Just like some bodies get flown back to their, you know, lot in a particular country that somebody said when i die bury me there amen abraham had said when i die i want to be buried there and so abraham uh, was there and he became blessed after abraham's death why because the spiritual baton had passed to another generation sometimes you won't get the fullness of your blessing till the baton passes amen but don't get out from behind because if you do there'll be nothing for you. Amen? Stay in place to receive the baton. Praise the God. That's what Elisha did. Elijah said to him, if you see me when I'm taken from you, because you've asked for something hard, then you're going to grab it. And what happened? The mantle, because he was in the right place, fell almost right on his shoulders. And he picked it up and said, ha, I'm ready now. Praise the Lord. Right, I want to bring this message to a close. Here are some learning points. In partnership, there must be disagreements. If there's no disagreement, what kind of partnership is that? That means somebody's not, not natural. You've got to have an opinion, and your opinions can't be the same all the time. Amen? So you're going to have to work out your differences. Praise the Lord. And guess what? The stronger party does not always win. Just because you may have the physical strength and the brains, why should you always win? That wouldn't be a partnership. Amen? In a partnership, God, if he was to be like that, we would never have a say in anything. Amen? But God, because of love, and because he wants a partnership, he concedes his rights. Amen? But that doesn't mean he doesn't love a good argument. I believe if you read Scripture honestly, you find that God loves a good argument. Jesus loved a good argument. Amen? He kept asking questions, didn't he? To see what kind of reason people would give him. Now, when you stop arguing with God, it's over. That's what we see from the life of Abraham. Abraham stopped arguing with God at the binding. He didn't put up any protest when he should have. Amen? And so his relationship with God, even though God honored it, it never progressed. There were no more encounters. There were no more instructions. So I'm pleading with you, don't stop arguing with God about what is right and concerns you. But make sure when you argue with God, you have a point. And your point shouldn't be just like, yes, Lord, but I, I don't want to give that. 
I mean, by all means, make that point a couple of times. But in the end, this is a relationship that requires some sacrifice. Amen? Obedience does not come without a cost. And if you're going to make progress with God, you're going to have to pay some price. Bless the Lord. Let's get into the closing prayer.